Every now and then, I enjoy watching a, a restoration show on TV. Now, if you've never seen these shows, what the, the hosts tend to do is to find something that is old or beat up or rusty or not working properly or broken in some way, and they take it back to their workshop, which is usually a whole lot cleaner and better equipped than the shed I'm in at the moment. And so they take it back to their workshop and they get to work on it. They, their goal is to restore it back to its original condition so that it can fulfill the purpose which its maker originally intended. And so they'll take this, this item back to their workshop and they'll pull it apart and they'll clean it up and they'll find maybe new parts that it needs to function properly. And then they'll, they'll give it a paint, they'll, they'll make it look nice, put it back together so that it's like new again that it's been restored to its original condition, like the day it first rolled off the assembly line or, or first was put into use. I'm always fascinated by the, the range of different items which they use for things like this. I mean, one of the most common ones is to find an old car, a, a classic car or a vintage car, which has maybe been, been sitting in a paddock for a long time and it's all rusted out and the engine seized. And they'll take it back and bit by bit, they'll painstakingly restore it back to its new condition. But there are some shows where they, they'll do almost anything. I saw once where one once where they had a um a, a soft drink vending machine, uh, like from the 50s or 60s, and again they they took it apart, they cleaned it up, they they fixed what was broken in it, and they made it like new. Another one that they had was was an old pinball machine, a, a vintage pinball machine, which again they they painstakingly pulled it apart, cleaned it up, fixed it up, and put it back to new. They restored it to new condition. It's kind of like if we had a push bike like that, something else we might want to restore, that's in less than perfect condition. No, no, what's happened to this one to make it look so bad? But the whole idea of restoring something is to take it from a condition like this and restore it so that it looks more like that. So it, it looks new, so it's clean, so it, it functions properly and it can actually fulfill the purpose that its maker intended for it. In other words, you can actually ride this push bike again now that it's been restored. There's a passage which is very well known, particularly among our Lutheran circles in Ephesians chapter 2, which talks about how we are saved by grace through faith for Christ's sake. It's one of those, you know, those core texts on which our church is built and talks very much about salvation being a gift from God. It's not something that we do to try to earn it, but it is a gift given completely by God. Now, a lot of people that I talk to about this text and about other places where the Bible talks about being saved or being gifted or graced with salvation, a lot of people think about salvation as going to heaven when we die. And so they understand the gospel very much in terms of Jesus lived, died, and is risen again so that when we die, we can live with God forever in eternity. And that basically becomes the, the whole idea of what it means to be saved, which really reflects my experience too. I mean, that was the idea of salvation, which was taught to me when I was young, that if I believe in Jesus, my sins are forgiven, and I get to go to heaven when I die. Now, that is an important part of the gospel. It is one of the important promises from God that when our lives on this earth are over, we do have a heavenly home to go to where everything is the way that God intended to be. There is no more sickness or dying or, or death that we read about in, in the end of Revelation, for example. And so it's, it's life the way God intended it right at the start of creation when he first put people on the planet. When we think about this idea of being saved, though, and just limit it to life forever in heaven when we die, we can miss out on a lot of the good that God intends for us and intends for others through us. You see, salvation, the biblical word for salvation or to be saved is, is actually broader than going to heaven when we die. The Greek New Testament word for saved can mean other things, such as Sometimes it's used to describe when a person is being healed or when they're being made whole in some way or when they are rescued, particularly in the Old Testament. When you read a lot of the Psalms, they, they look for God's salvation to actually be rescued from a physical threat that is threatening their lives. Another way in which the Bible uses this same word, which we usually understand as being saved, is to be restored. 
In other words, the idea of God's salvation is that he restores our health. He restores our hope. He actually restores us. And that's where I'm intrigued with thinking about salvation and being saved in terms of the, these TV shows where you know the hosts actually find something that is old or broken or rusty or messed up and they restore it to its new condition. Because in a way, that's like the salvation that God gifts to us because of what Jesus has done for us. Yes, he promises us life in heaven forever when we die, but I heard it once said, and I love it, that salvation is just as much about the lives we live here and now as it is about the lives we'll live in heaven when we die. I'll say that again. The salvation that the Bible talks about is just as much about living here and now as it is living with God forever in heaven when we die. For example, if we go back to this Ephesians 2 passage, Paul talks about a time when the readers of this letter were once dead in their sins. But then in verse 4, he says, God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. He's not just talking about this salvation or this life that Christ gave to us as being something we'll enjoy in the future. He's talking about life now. And that's where he first says, it's by grace that you have been saved. And what I'm going to ask you to do or kind of challenge you to do is instead of just reading saved and thinking about life forever in heaven, actually think about it in terms of being restored. He's talking about the life that we have now through Christ. And he says, it's by grace you have been restored. What he's talking about there is that everything in us that is, is broken or is messed up or is not the way God intended it to be. Everything about us that actually, you know, the way that sin affects our lives, it is taken from us. We are cleaned up from that. We are repaired. We are healed. As he says a little bit later, we are made new through faith in Jesus. And so the restoration process that God works in our lives is to actually clean us up, fix us up, give us a new life to restore us to our original human condition which God intended from the beginning of creation. A kind of life where sin has no power in us and we can live in freedom and in faith and in hope and in love. God's work in our lives through Jesus and by the power of his Spirit is to actually restore us, like this push bike, like that pinball machine, like those cars on those shows, to restore us to new condition so that we can live the lives that God intends for us right here and right now. And so as Paul continues, he, th this idea of being restored, being, being something that God is working on, being people that God is working on and, and restoring bit by bit in our lives. It's something that continues through Ephesians chapter 2. Because then after Paul writes that God saved us, and I'm going to say God has restored us by his grace when we believed, not that we can take credit for it, because this restoration isn't something that we work on, this restoration of our lives as God's people. It's a gift from God. And so this salvation, this restoration, isn't a reward for the good things we've done so that no one can boast about it. He says, because we are God's masterpiece. Now, this word that the New Living Translation translates as masterpiece, again, it has a couple of different ways that the New Testament translations um, interpret it. For example, in other places, it, you can talk about being, you are God's handiwork or you are God's workmanship. And, and I love this idea of the Heavenly Father actually taking us off the rubbish heap of life where sin puts us with all of our brokenness and our mess and the way that we and our lives are just completely dysfunctional. We're not working the way that God intended us to work from the beginning, but God values us. And so he rescues us from the rubbish heap of life and he brings us into his workshop and he begins to restore us because he is the master craftsman. I love it that Jesus was a carpenter because he knew what it was like to, to, to work with his hands. And so just like a carpenter or a chippy might restore a piece of furniture. So through Christ, God is actually at work restoring us because we are his workmanship. We are his, his handiwork. We are his masterpiece. 
through the circumstances of our lives and as we listen to God's word and connect like we've been talking the last couple of weeks, connect his promises with the reality of our lives, with the struggles, with the joys, with the hopes, with the problems that we battle through. God is working through those things, through his word and the circumstances of our life by the power of the Holy Spirit to restore us, to clean us up from those things that that mess our lives up, to to heal those parts of our lives that may be broken, to, to give us wholeness again, as this word saved talks about. God is restoring us and our lives because he is the one who's at work in our life through his word and by the power of his spirit. We are his handiwork. We are his workmanship. He is at work in us to actually restore us to being the people that he intended us to be and he intends us to be so that we can be his masterpieces. And so just like the hosts of these shows, we'll take something off the rubbish heap And they will restore it to new condition. So the promise that God gives to us through this promise of salvation in Ephesians 2 is that God is doing the same thing in our lives. That he takes us off the rubbish heap of life because he values us and he sees something good in us. And through his grace, through his mercy, through the promises he gives us in scripture, the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, restoring us, chipping off the edges, smoothing off those rough parts, helping us learn what it means to to live in faith and hope and love so that we can be the people that he's calling us to be. And he does that not just so that he can put us on a wall and admire us like like a, a piece of art, but he does this for a reason. He does this so that we can fulfill his purpose for us in our lives. Because verse 10 goes on and says, after, you know, we are God's masterpiece, we are God's handiwork, we are God's workmanship. It says that God has created us new in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. In this text, God reveals to us his purpose for us in our lives. We're not meant just to go through life waiting for heaven, which is what we can sometimes do. And I actually used to think when I thought the whole point of salvation was getting to heaven. God actually intends us for a purpose right here and right now as his workmanship, as his handicraft and as his masterpieces. See, when I look at the world around me, there is a lot that is broken. There is a lot that is wrong. There is a lot of people who are living in pain and suffering and worry and fear and anxiety. And that's not the life that God intends for us. And he wants to restore other people, to restore relationships, to restore the world, to work with him in bringing things back to the way that he intended things to be, where there is peace joy and hope and love and so what Paul is saying here in in verse 10 is that God has lined up he has prepared a whole lot of good for us to do in our lives so that as we do good as his workmanship as his masterpieces we're actually bringing the goodness of God that we encounter in Jesus into the world and into the lives of the people around us think about what that might look like that Today, whenever you're watching this, today God has planned and prepared a whole lot of good for you to do for the people around you, for the people in your life, for your society, for our world, so that we can bring his goodness into a world and give people hope. Now, that isn't always doing big, spectacular, amazing things. Sometimes it's just the small acts of things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control that we can live out each and every day of our lives. Now, we don't have to look for these things. Paul promises us, or God promises us through Paul, that God has already prepared these things for us to do. He has prepared good for us to do in our lives and in the lives of our friends and neighbours and families and churches and community and schools and colleges and wherever we are God has set up a whole lot of good for us to do so we don't actually have to go looking for it all we need to do is through the strength of the spirit is to have our eyes open and to see all the amazing opportunities that God has prepared in advance for us to be able to bring the goodness of his grace and love and mercy and forgiveness and hope into the lives of the people around us Which makes me wonder, what does God have prepared for you to do today? 
in this coming week, in the coming weeks and months, what opportunities will God be bringing across your way in order to do good so that his goodness can enter a, a broken and hurting world and that people can encounter his love and his grace and his goodness through you? Because each and every day, God has prepared good for you to do so that as his restored masterpiece, you can be sharing his goodness with people around you and God can actually bring his goodness to the world through you. And so in what ways do our lives need to be restored, to be made like new, to be returned to the way that our creator intended them to be? We can take these broken parts of our lives and messy parts of our lives and we can bring them to him and we can look for his grace and his forgiveness. We live as God's saved people now, not just forever in heaven, but we live as God's saved, healed, redeemed, whole, his restored people now. He does that for us by the grace that he gives to us in Jesus. And as God's restored people, we are his handiwork. You are his masterpiece. But he makes you his masterpiece for a reason, so you can find purpose in your life so that you can do the good that he's already prepared in advance for you to do. So God give you his grace so that first of all you can know who you are as his saved and restored masterpiece, but also so you can be doing the good that he's called you to do and you, as his masterpiece, can bring his goodness into the lives of everyone you meet.